<laughs> testing one two three testing all right tonight is going to be now I know why actually I still don't know why but I believe that God has a reason uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, if you would I'm going to turn a few places like I said I had a message laid out and uh, but I feel like the spirit of God has got me going in a different direction Uh, one passage is Jeremiah 29 11 and I'm going to read that last but I want to go to Acts 16.31. How many likes the music? I like that. Um, you know, I go to churches where they have, uh, you know, a nice uh, organ player, piano player, and they play in the background while the minister preaches, and I love that. It sets the mood. That's why I like that. But, uh, but uh, Acts 16.31 and it says so they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household and then go with me to 2 Peter 3 9 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 okay I'm in first Peter let me go here we go second Peter 3 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long suffering towards us not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. Somebody say, all come to repentance. And then I want to finish with Jeremiah 29, 11. These are all going to be my foundational scriptures for where I'm going tonight. Actually, um, this is a message. This wasn't my original message that I was going to preach tonight, but I want to go with what the Holy Spirit is putting on my heart. And... Uh, while you're turning there. Thank you, Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. Okay. And it says this. This is probably out of all the Bible. This is one of my most favorite. And I'm not embellishing that. One of my favorite scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I'm going to read on down. Then you will call upon me and go and pray unto me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Now for the next few moments, I'm going to put this aside, and I just want to talk to you for a minute. I want to I want to share a story about a young a little girl. It's how, this is how I'm going to start, and I don't know where the Holy Spirit's going to lead me, how He's going to finish this. I want to talk to you about a little girl who was raised in New York. Uh, she um, she had two brothers, and um, she had two sisters. Her being the third sister, so the, she was she came out of a family of five. Um, her uh, one sister and one brother served in the Lord, and the others weren't. Um, and this little girl grew up uh, raised um, raised Catholic. Uh, in fact, her uh, her mother, her father, and um, even her uh, gr- grandmother, her grandfather, and so on. They came out of Italy. So they were raised Catholic. And uh, most uh, people that will be listening to this by internet whatnot, they know that most a lot of New Yorkers are Catholic. Because a lot of them 
You know, it's just, it goes with that region. So, anyhow, um, she was raised in Catholicism, but something happened. The, she always was, she called herself the black sheep of the family. She was not the popular one. She was the wild one. Come on. Maybe some of them's in your family. Watch out now. Um, she didn't feel like she fit in. She felt like she was like the square peg in the round hole. Well, as time progressed, I mean, she lived a very hard life. Um, she came out of the, um, just a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, this and so on and so forth. Um, as life progressed, her mother ended up um, get, getting saved and came out of Catholicism. Um, she actually became Pentecostal. Was, uh, got, got touched by the Spirit of God. Gave her heart to the Lord. Her um, and her husband or this young girl's mother and father. So here they are serving the Lord. Um, again, uh, this, this young girl, her sister, um, her closest sister is now serving the Lord and her closest brother is now serving the Lord. So as time goes on, and then she starts serving the Lord. But as time goes on, Somebody say, as time goes on, life. Come on, somebody say, life happens. But remember my text, Jeremiah 29, 11. God has a plan. Okay, so as time progressed, um, she ended up, uh, this little girl is no longer a little girl, but a young woman. She begins to rebel against the plan of God. And she begins to go into a season of prodigal living. She was raised in the 60s love era. Come on, I'm, I'm touching some people's right where you're at now, where you came out of. So I can already, you, if you know about the 60s love era, you know all the crazy stuff. So this young woman began to get involved in drugs and the alcohol, and we're talking hard drugs, LSD and cocaine and, and everything, and even some crazy stuff out there that, uh, that I'm not even going to even talk about. Um, her life began to spiral out of control. She had suicidal thoughts, depression. She, again, she uh, this even isolated her farther from her family. However, she had a sister and brother who did not give up on her and kept praying night and day that she would come back to serve God. But years progressed. She um, she just kept deeper and deeper into suicidal thoughts. She, in fact, she would write her closest sister continually on a continual basis they would have conversation because what, what had happened is this young woman who remember they all lived in New York well this young woman decided that she is going to uh, this, this life is no longer for her so she upped and moved to Kentucky and there when she moved to Kentucky um, she got involved in a relationship outside of marriage it became an entire mess um, she got she got involved with a man who was an alcoholic. Um, she made wrong decisions. And she remember she kept in contact with her uh, closest sister and began to write to her. And they, they kept conversation over and over and over again. And in fact, in one of the letters, she stated how she was at the end of the rope. And she was ready to end her life. And she didn't see any purpose in life. She was very depressed. She had suicidal tendencies. But she found out that she was pregnant. And when she found out she was pregnant, she wrote back to her sister, and her sister replied, Mary, I believe that this child is a blessing from God and will turn your life around, and I believe it's from God. And if you'll listen to God, He's got a plan for your life. Now keep in mind, at this time, this woman was heavily into drugs, drinking, Suicidal tendencies and everything. So this woman, the Spirit of God touched her heart one night. When she was all alone, she began to pray. Because she, come on, she was, the Bible says, when you train up a child in the way in which they should go, when they're older, they shall not depart from it. So that she knew, she knew how to call on God. So she began to weep and cry and call on God. And she felt the Spirit of God come upon her. In fact, uh, she developed a tumor during somewhere during this time and she contacted her sister and her sister stood in the gap and interceded and prayed to God that God would spare her life and heal her and God totally healed her even while she was in a backslidden state so God touched her and she 
did everything she could, and she says, I'm going to give this child a, a chance. And I'm here to tell you, she, she stopped cold turkey. I'm, I'm talking no drinking, no alcohol, no drugs, nothing. And even the doctors said that, you know, it's a good thing you're, you're doing this, but I, we've got to warn you that there could be serious side effects because it's already in your bloodstream, this and that to the child, so we want to let you know that. Now, you may ask, well, where are you going with this preacher? I want you to let you know that I'm glad the woman that I'm talking about, who was the little girl that was raised in New York, did this. I'm glad that she kept the child because the child that we're speaking of tonight is me. Now, now I'm going to take you on a journey if you don't mind. I've, now, some of y'all have heard this, but I'm going to go into detail tonight because somebody needs to hear this. Um, the young girl was my mother. Her, her, her closest sister is my Aunt Josie. And uh, she lives now in North Carolina, one of the godliest women I've ever met in my life. And if it wasn't for her prayers, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, I'm going to take you back to about 1999. Here's, here I am, 22 years of age. My mom, living with my parents. My mom backslid now just because now I gotta let you know this she she cried out to God she did this God gave her I was born no side effects to God be the glory um, now at times my wife says I'm a little crazy but I don't think that was from that but uh, now listen but I want to show you something man this is deep if you'll receive it tonight so here I am raised in an ungodly home because she gets connected with my step. Now, the man who she got connected with and bore this child was my father. And when I was about five months old, he left. And I never saw him again. Okay? Now watch. I uh, So for 22 years, my stepfather raised me. Now, my stepfather was very hard. He was from the Ozarks of Missouri. I mean, one of the toughest guys I'll ever meet in my life. And um, he was very old school. I'm talking on everything. You, brother, you cut your finger half off, and he'll tell you to duct tape it and, and soak it in kerosene and get over it. How many, how many knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, you break your leg out there. He's like, boy, you better put them legs or bone back in. I ain't paying for that. I got scars on me where I should have went to the doctor and didn't, but I'm still alive. Um, but he was, he was an alcoholic. And so for 22 years I was raised in a home with mental, verbal, physical abuse, alcoholism. God wasn't even nowhere a part of it, but I want, you to show, I want to show you something. Listen, if you'll get this, there would be times in my life I would be sick and things would happen that I thought uh, actually, I almost died several times in bike accidents and so on like a bicycle not a motorcycle but I should have died but God was watching over me and he had a plan watch out when I get to this message you'll understand it but she uh, so several times um, the enemy tried to take me out just like he tried to take my mother out and uh I would be sick and have some kind of affliction. And she would say, pray to Jesus and He will heal you. Even Listen, this is astounding. You, you got, don't miss this. Here she is drinking, not serving God, not going to the house of God. But she still has the Word of God. Come on. The Bible says in the book of John that the Word of God is the seed of God. And once it's in you, you ain't getting it out of you. You could run but you can't hide because it's in your DNA. Even the prodigal son who took his inheritance and fled and ran, come on, the seed of God was in him and that's why he got all the way to the miry pit and said, what am I doing? And he came back. So she taught me that if I was sick, pray to Jesus. And I'm telling you, brother, he healed me several times when I was little, when I was young. So... But I had no understanding of who Jesus was. I just knew He was God. 
But I didn't know that he I, I didn't know the details of the gospel. Here I am, 22 years of age. And I'm out here and I'm going in the same path as my mother. Because when, when somebody tells you that generational curses can pass, they're, they're not lying. They, they will. So in other words, the devil, will, the devil operates in generations just like God operates in generations. In other words, and the Bible talks about the sins of the father will go four generations. So I already know and I'm on guard of what the enemy's going to try to bring at my son. Come on, preach on. Because I know what he threw at me. Okay, so here's the devil's working on me at 22 years of age trying to get me in the same path. You know, uh, fornication, drugs, prodigal, I mean, just this ungodly life that can lead me to death, early grave, come on somebody, destruction, heartache, pain. I already inquired over $21,000 of debt at 22 years of age. Don't ask, it's a whole story. But it, all this burden's on my mom. Here I am doing drugs and hanging with the wrong crowd. Didn't finish high school. Had to get my GED. See, I'm going deep tonight. That's all right. I can't believe you would say that. Listen, who cares? It's about Jesus. If I can help somebody, I'm going to. Well, boy, I can't believe you. You don't have a high school, edu uh, high school education. You're preaching the gospel. That's all right. If God can use dumb fishermen, He can use me, surely. Come on. I, I heard a man of God say one time, you can have 32 degrees on the wall and still be cold as ice. So listen, here I am, 22 years of age, spiraling in the same direction as my mother, but all the while I've got a praying aunt who prayed my mother through, who's going to pray me through and didn't even know it. So here I am, 22 years of age, hanging with my buddies, partying, doing all I can. But for years, but at 22 years of age, all of a sudden, something ain't right. Because I'm having what some people would say a midlife crisis at 22 years of age. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Because I'm becoming very emotional. I'm feeling like, what is the purpose in life? Come on, have you ever been there? I know, you know, all you, uh, you know, the people that wasn't raised in church, and come on, y'all can amen me on this. So the devil walked with me hand in hand and showed me what he could offer me. But I was fed up with it. I was tired of it. I was tired of sinning. I was tired of laying my head at night, not knowing if I was going to wake up tomorrow and be alive, whatever. I was scared to die. Because I didn't, I, come on, I wasn't serving God. And so I was looking for that happiness and everything I could get my hands on. I mean, some of you all have heard this, so bear with me and I'll share some stuff that you haven't heard. But for those who've never heard this, this is going to be a blessing to you. So here I am in the parking lot of a convenience store smoking weed. Yes. And I look over at my friend, who I'm not going to name, because I don't want to get him in trouble if he's, you know, just out of wisdom. Because I don't think he's doing this anymore, to God be the glory. But here I am smoking marijuana in this car. And I look at him, and he looks at me, and I look up at the sky, and look at the stars of the heaven. And I said, I'm tired of this. He's like, what do you mean? I said, this it, it's pointless. There's, there's no, I'm not getting, this, this is not doing nothing for me anymore. What is the purpose of life? So then, I, uh, I leave, you know, and I remember I came home that night and I'm like, what is wrong with me? You know, what's going on inside of me? Because listen, prayer changes things. You know what was happening? Somebody was praying for me and I didn't know it. But then I had a, a, a really good friend of mine who, we, we were, uh, grew up together. But what happened to him that I didn't recognize because I was too busy serving the devil and partying with, you know, with the wrong crowd, I didn't recognize. But now when I look back on it, I get it. But then I didn't. But I was uh, one of my good, but good friends, he grew up, he got saved. And he gave his heart to the Lord. So now he's praying for me. My aunt's praying for me. And who? God only knows who else is still praying for me. So all these people are bombarding hell for me. Come on, anybody getting this? Remember our text, Acts 16.31. 16, 
2 Peter 3, 9, Jeremiah 29, 11. It'll all start making sense. God is not slack concerning His promises, but wills that none perish and all come to repentance. Okay, so here I am. I go out with my buddy who's... Uh, and I notice something about him now. I look back. He didn't cuss. He didn't do drugs. He didn't party. But he was still fun. Hey, come on. So, you know, have you ever heard the lie? Well, I don't want to go to church and hang out with people of God because there's no fun. Well, you come hang out with me. I'll have fun. I don't need drugs to have fun. I don't need... Come on. I don't need a drink to have fun. I don't need to be smoked up, drugged up, shot up. I don't need all that to have a good time. I can have, Come on. I can get high on Jesus... I can get, uh, I can have a good time and, and not have all that stuff, and not, and you can wake up the next morning and not worry about how much money you've blown, or come on, who you woke up beside. Come on, get real, or what you caught. So here I am, going, and so I'm hanging out with him, and we go to a Kroger parking lot. See, I'll never forget this. Now I look back on it. I, I go to a Kroger parking lot and I'm sitting out there talking to him. I said, you know, so-and-so, I said, something really weird is happening to me. And he starts laughing. I'm like, man, you're supposed to be sympathizing with me. What are you laughing at me for? I thought he was making fun of me. But you know why he was laughing? Because he knew God was working on my heart. And I, I looked at my watch and I said, for some reason, I feel like I'm running out of time. Now, y'all remember that because I'm going somewhere with this. I said, I feel like I'm running out of time. I don't even know. I said, maybe I'm going to die or something. I don't know, but I feel really weird. And I start, I mean, tearing up from this. I'm like, man, this is not good. And um, so that's when he invited me to church. He said, listen, why don't you come to church with me? And I flat out rebuked him. I said, I ain't going to church. That ain't for me. It's not my cup of tea. And this is not the answer. I don't want church. He's like, look, it ain't about church. He said, it's about Jesus. You need Jesus. But why don't you come to church so you can find out what this thing's about? And I said, no. And I blew him off like six times. So God's dealing with me. So then one night, again, and I'm going to fast forward, cut some of this out. He invites me to church on a Friday night. I come with my girlfriend at the time who is my wife now. Uh, we're living in fornication at the time. Um, but you know what? That didn't intimidate God. Come on. I said that didn't intimidate God. That will intimidate pastors. Come on, somebody. And preachers and religious people, but that didn't intimidate God. See, because most churches wouldn't let them in their church. Oh my God, we can't let them in here. What will the... People think. Who cares? Jesus said it's the sick that need the doctor, not the well. Because I'm so thankful the little country church in Shepherdsville, Kentucky opened their doors to me, a sinner with my girlfriend who also was a backslid Baptist and led us in to have some food and fellowship because I came in and praise and worship you got to keep in mind, guys, I wasn't raised in church, so when I come in here and they turn on praise and worship and people's got their hands up, I'm freaking out. What is this? I'm used to, come on, I'm listening to, I'm listening to everything from Metallica to Tupac to, I, that's my kind of music that I was listening to. Come on. Journey, Pink Floyd, country music. I listened to everything back then. So I, here I come in, and this is totally different. And they got their hands up. And I'm like, what in the world? And then all of a sudden, we get about 15 minutes into it, and something comes on me. And it was almost as if somebody took, it was almost like the whole room was dark, and somebody took a huge spotlight and shined it right on my heart or right on me, and it's like you could see all the dirt. Uh, have you ever had a white shirt or a black shirt? And you get in, come on somebody, you get in a dark place, I'm going to use a dark suit, ready? You get in a dark room and, you, and it looks good. You may have some spots, but then the more light that's exposed to you, you go outside in the sunlight, you'll see every little stain and dark. So it felt like, Somebody was exposing every little thing on me. So I start crying. I, 
And I'm like, what in the world is wrong with me? Why am I doing this? But I didn't know, but I know now it was the presence of Almighty God and the Holy Spirit moving upon my heart, drawing me to Jesus. Because the Bible says that no man comes unto the Father lest he be drawn by the Spirit. See, but the problem is, oh, I can preach right here. If you don't go to church, if you don't go to a church where they're presence driven, you'll never have that experience. In other words, my God, if we've got sinners coming in the church and they're leaving the same way they came in, then there's something wrong with our church, honey. We need to reevaluate what we're doing. Amen. So you want to know why I'm radical? Come on, I ain't got nothing to go back to. That's why I'm so radical and passionate about the Lord. I've walked with the devil. I know what it's like. I know what he has to offer. I've been on that side of the tracks. I wasn't raised in church all my life. Because I get that. Well, you, you were probably raised in church all your life and that's all you know. No, 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 no. No, no. I've seen, I've, I've sat in drugs, I've sat in, in rooms. Listen, I've sat in rooms where some of my best friends were taking heroin needles and shooting them in their arm, Roger. And I watched it. But I had enough fear of God in me, even though I wasn't serving God, not to pick that up and put it in my arm. So listen, some of you, if it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be sitting here. Amen. You know what that was? The restraining power of the Holy Spirit working through praying people even when I didn't recognize it. So here I am, June 2nd, 2000, 7.45 p.m. I'm sitting in a, in, a, in a service. The Holy Spirit's moving on me. And man, He's working on my heart. They tell us to sit down and my heart's just sitting there. Sweating. The evangelist gets up. He starts preaching about hell of all things. Come on, not money. Sow a seed into my ministry and God will bless you with a new car and a new house. No, honey. He went straight for the throat and he preached hell fire. Why? Because this man was more concerned about my soul, Joe, than he was about my pocketbook. And I'm so thankful that he did. So he gives an altar call. And he says, is there anybody in here tonight that has never given their heart to Jesus and you've never, your name's not in the Lamb's book of life. Well, I knew I wouldn't because nobody ever shared that with me. And he says, if you're not, then this is your eternal destiny. And brother, I'm telling you what, I grabbed Melissa, who's my girlfriend at the time, and I said, I'm going up there. I have to. My heart was beating out of my chest. And I said, and it was like, I don't know how to explain this, but it was like the climb. I saw my whole life flash before me. Everything, the watch, what I was seeking. I couldn't find this and that, the emptiness. It was like, shoo, and it just climaxed. And I knew this is what I've been missing. And I said, will you go up there with me? And I mean, tears are streaming down her face. And she said, not only will I go up there with you, I'll go first. So she goes up there, and I run up there too. And I collapsed on the altar. Brother, I wept. I, I didn't say... I didn't pray a little, you know, the ABCs of prayer, you know, repeat this after me. I couldn't even articulate words and it was pouring out of my heart. And that day, that night, I gave my heart to Jesus, came, up that, came off that altar and I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. And everything climaxed. Now watch, I'm going somewhere with this. You may be saying, well, what does the little girl, your mother got through this at the beginning? Watch. This is where I want to take you. So now, here I am, born again, saved. I, the first person I called was my aunt because I knew she was a godly woman. And when I told her, she, she cried and wept. She says, I've been praying and praying and praying and standing in the gap. I've been rebuking devils from hell that's been trying to take you, that try to kill you. And she said, I knew God was going to answer my prayers. Oh, come on, somebody. You ain't listening to me. She was standing on Acts 16.39. Believe on... Or Acts, uh, yeah, 16.39. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and ye and your whole house shall be saved. So here I am, I got saved. Now, I began, I knew. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and He said, I'm going to use you to get your mother back to me. See, God never gives up on us. 
no matter how far we get away from him. I'm sorry, guys, if I get emotional, but this message is so powerful if you'll just receive it tonight. So here I am. I go to my mom. And so my aunt beat me to it. She calls up my mom. She says, you, do you know your son gave his heart to the Lord? And she starts crying. And she says, wow, that is so amazing. But watch, I come and I run into her arms and I grab her. And I'm just weeping on her shoulder. And she says, why are you crying? I said, mom, I said, I will not let you go to hell. I said, God wants you back. I said, he's calling your name. And she looked at me. I mean, I'm tears in her eyes streaming down her face. And she says, you know, I can't come to church. And you know, I can't do this because you're stepfather. And I rebuked her. And I said, it's going to be you that stands before God and nobody else. I said, you've got to... I said, God is reaching back out to you. And he's saying, come back. Now, so, so I keep praying for her. And... Uh, we we eventually move out way out south, and one night um, we lived in an apartment. And at this time, we we started going to a church out in uh, Hart County, Kentucky, way out south. And we're living in an apartment over here in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. I laid on my face before God one night on the carpet, and I cried tears for for over two hours I cried and wept and I pleaded with God I said God don't let my mother and don't let my stepdad go to hell whatever it takes God don't let them go to hell I mean I, I'm talking about come on interceding travailing with God I got up off the floor I mean I could hardly I was so I call it drunk in the spirit excuse me but I was just so lightheaded in the spirit of God and whew, I mean I slept good that night I had peace I said, you know what? I can't do anything else, Roger. I just give it to the Lord. Come on. When ha having done all, stand therefore. So that weekend, you listen, that weekend, that Sunday, we had a guest evangelist come, a real prophet of God. He came, uh, he began to preach, preach. And I was on the front row, sitting here on the front row. And he was up here preaching. Because come on, I like sitting in the front because I want to get all the bread I can get, honey. He was sitting on the front row and he looked at me dead in the face. He said, young man, he said, come here. And when I stood up, the presence of God hit me so strong, I began to shake. Under the Listen, I can tell you when a man of God's getting ready to say something heavy before he ever opens his mouth because I can bear witness to it in my spirit. He opened his mouth. He laid hands on my head and he says, the Spirit of Almighty God, I'll never forget this. Brother, this was probably 13 years ago and I remember it like it was yesterday. He laid his hands on me. He said, the Spirit of God says unto you, not more than three nights ago, you were on your face before me and you were crying out that your mother and your stepfather would be saved and the Lord would say unto you tonight, He has heard your prayers and He will answer you speedily. Brother, do you know what that did to me? Here's a guy I didn't even know. Told me that. Look, my hair standing up. He told me that, and I, I'm talking. I wept like a baby and fell on my face and cried out to God and said, "Thank you, God." Now, so I go back. You know, occasionally I would come and visit my mother, and all of a sudden, my mom. Uh, she said, "You know, the oddest thing." She said, "I keep finding watches everywhere," and we were out in her driveway, and she found a watch in her driveway. And she says, I don't even know whose watch this is, but I keep finding these watches. And the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me as clear as I'm talking to you. And he says, tell her that she is running out of time. Sound familiar? Yes. I told you it was going to get deep. And I'm not embellishing any of this. God is my witness. I'm telling you the truth. And I looked at her and I said, Mom, God is saying you're running out of time. And again, I grabbed her and I prayed and I said, I will not let you go to hell. And she, again, she, we wept, so on and so forth. And here I am working on my stepdad who his, uh, his first wife died of cancer. He had a dog that got hit by a car. He prayed for this little dog to be healed. He wasn't raised in church, but he heard of God. He prayed that this dog would be healed and God didn't heal his dog. And he became bitter. And then his wife got sick with cancer. And he prayed that she'd be healed and she died. And from that point on, brother, you'd be surprised people... See, so a lot of times we give up on people and we say there's no hope for them. But we don't know what they've been through. 
So, here's a man who had no faith in God because of life, what brought, you know I mean? Think about some of this stuff. If you went through the, you know, we, we can understand the dog, but I've ne- I can't relate to having a spouse for years and having them die. I can't relate to that. So this man's carrying around a hard heart. And he don't, every time I talk about God, I don't want to hear that stuff, blankety blank. I mean, he would curse God. And I'm driving down the road, and I'm, 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 I'm getting to a point here. I'm, I'm showing you how God works in lives of people. And he doesn't give up on them, and he has a plan. So I'm going down the road one day, and I said, God, you've got to show me how to get to, to, through the, to this hard heart. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you've never told him in your 23 years of living that you love him. Because we didn't have that kind of relationship. You, we just didn't say that. Because he was an alcoholic. He, we didn't like each other. I'm just being honest. We didn't. I respected the man. And I did. I loved him because he was the only father I had. Because my real father wasn't there. So even though we didn't like each other, we didn't get along, I respected the man. Even more so after I got saved because I, God gave me mercy, right? He showed me how to give mercy. So the Lord spoke to me and says, I want you to tell him that you love him. This is what will crack his heart. And I started crying because I knew that was God because I didn't think of that. So it's time. So God opened an opportunity for me one night. We were standing there and I looked at him and it was hard for me to say that. I'm just telling you it was. Some of y'all don't understand that but you don't know what it was like to be raised how I was. And I looked at him in the face and said, Jack, I just want to let you know. I said, you know, I was like, um, I know you raised your kids the best you know how. And I went to go through all this stuff that he went through. I said, but I just want to let you know that I love you. And that I care about you. And I'll, and I'll do anything in the world for you. And he started crying. And that made me cry. Because I've never seen the man cry in 23 years. Because he was raised like that. Don't you cry. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, you don't cry. And he started crying. And you know what he said? He says, I didn't talk about God. He looked at me and says, how do you know that I've never talked to God? And when he said that, I about fell out. So I knew then that God was working on his heart. Now, so around, I'm going to fast forward to about 2004. Well, I'm going to Evangel World Prayer Center under Pastor Bob Rogers. He has what's called a 21-day fast. He has it every year. So I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. So Melissa and I decided to partake of our first 21-day fast. Well, we got three, we got three days into it, and Melissa has this dream. And in this dream, she wakes me up. She says, "I had the strangest dream." She says, "You got to hear this." She said, "In this dream, um, we were in a church service." And after church, you met your father, your real father. And I laughed, like Sarah laughed, because of my unbelief. And said, right. Because remember, I didn't even know he was alive. I didn't know where this man was. I hadn't seen him. And I said, well, and then I was almost like, well, you know, if this is God, it's God. So I said, well, we'll see. We'll put it on the shelf, see what happens. And then... Now, keep in mind, I'm over $20-something thousand dollars in debt, even when we got married. We're still fighting to get our way out of this debt. So we have a dream. Uh, I have a dream. And in this dream, um, I'm sitting in this congregation. Now this is what you can, uh, you can go to some of the archives at Evangel World Prayer Center. And this is one of the testimonies that Pastor Bob Rogers talks about. Because this was on national television, what I'm about to tell you. I had this dream. We were in the congregation and Pastor Bob was giving out these crowns. And he was putting them on people's heads. And I couldn't read what you know certain people's crowns was, but when he came to me, he hand he was getting he put this crown on my head, and when I looked at the crown, there was a date and there was a dollar amount. Come on, somebody! And it was like twenty thousand dollars had a date and a plus, and he put this crown on my head in this dream, and I woke up and I said, I told Bliss, I said, I really feel like God is going to supernaturally move on our on our debt and, and God somehow is going to work it out and we're going to pay off these debts and it's going to be by a certain date and she said why and I told her this dream and she says okay so now so time goes on about a week or so Melissa gets a phone call now keep in mind now I got to tell you this when Melissa was born watch this when Mel- this is how deep this goes I mean it's profound when Melissa was born her middle her maiden name was Hamilton 
when she was born, her biological father left her. And she was delivered by her uncle named Ricky. When I was born, my name is Ricky. The doctor who delivered me was Hamilton, Dr. Hamilton. And my father left me when I was little. Is that not profound right there? So here we are about two weeks into this fast. She gets a phone call from her dad who she has not spoken to in years and said, uh, your grandmother's dying. We need you. I just want to let you know if you want to come out to Virginia, so on and so forth. So she goes out there by herself, goes out to Virginia in the winter, goes out there, drives out there. She calls me on the telephone. She goes, you've got to hear this. She said, this man, when we get out there, she said, we got to talk, and he says, listen, he goes, I know I haven't been in your life all these years, but I feel like I want to do, she said, he said, I have not paid this child support, and I'm going to financially help you any way I can. Now look, to make a long story short, because for sake of time, God ended up blessing us supernaturally, financially, to pay off all those debts by a certain time. So here, I go, so this happens. I go to Pastor Bob Rogers and tell him the testimony of the dream, the crowns, the money, the certain amount of the debt. He is so blown out of the water. He says, you've got to share this on Word Alive on national television or on Evangel Presents on 1030 on Sunday mornings. Okay. So here's Sunday morning. He's like, come up here. You know, this on national television in front of on camera. People, I'm nervous. I wasn't preaching then. I was called to preach, but I wasn't preaching yet. So he calls Melissa and I out there. I'll, I'll have to bring the video to you guys. I, I got the actual video. How many would like to see that? The actual broadcast of that. Okay, I'll show it to you. So I'll bring it. Remind me and I'll bring it one day. Um, so here I am on national television and I share this testimony live on TV. And everybody's like, shh, you know, praise God, hallelujah, you know. And I go and I sit back down. We're sitting there and 10 minutes later, and Usher comes over and taps me on the shoulder and says, are you Ricky Scaparo? I said, yes, I am. He said, there's a man out here in the parking lot that claims is your father and he wants to speak to you. Brother, you got to be kidding me. I'm, I got chills again. I'm about to fall over. Huh? And so it's, I'm kind of numb. So I, I'm like, okay. So I'm, I've got all these emotions. I'm scared. They're still kind of hurts. Now, pu pu push the pause button for a second. We're going to go back. I want to go back about four months before that happened. I was, at, I was still an evangel. I'm in a, and I'm in a meeting with Tommy Tenney. Tommy Tenney is preaching and he's talking about relationships with our Heavenly Father and our Earthly Father. And he began to give a prophetic word. He said, there's somebody or somebody's here that you have been hurt by your biological father. Your father left you years ago, whatever. He says, you're harboring bitterness and hurt, and you've even asked the Lord if he's still alive. And brother, I knew he was speaking to me. And I was sitting in that pew, not up on the altar, in the pew, and I, I had my head down, and I wept hot tears. I mean, my heart was broken, and I cried out to the Lord. I said, God, I just want to know if he's alive. And the Lord spoke to me and says, do you forgive your father for what he did? And I said, I want to know if he's alive. The Lord didn't answer me. He says, do you forgive him? And I, and I released him that right there in the service. I said, God, I release him to you. But the Lord never answered me. Now we fast forward. Here we are in this service. Your dad is out here in the parking lot. Listen, brother, I, pastor, I believe if I would have not forgiven my father right there, I don't think the Lord would have allowed it to happen. I know that's deep. But so I go out. And there he is, standing in the, in the, in the uh, parking lot. And I'm like, he goes, Ricky? I said, yeah. He goes, I'm Philip. I'm your father. And I'm just like, uh, how? What? Now watch this. You ready for this? This is going to blow you out of the water. I said, how? He said, listen. He said, we, watch it. Okay, Evangel World Prayer Center has two services. Somebody say two services. They have a 9 o'clock service and a 10.30 service. We went to the 10.30 service. My father went to the 9 o'clock service. What? 
and never knew that I was attending the same church as me. Or he never knew it to me. He went to the 9 o'clock service that day, came home, and him and my, his step, or my stepmom was getting ready to pack up and leave, go out of town that weekend. And they had it on 21 on the service, and they heard Pastor Bob say, I want, and he, when he said my name to come up and share the testimony, my dad froze and said, what? And he looked, and he said, my God, that's my son, whom I've been wanting to know if he was around, if he's okay, whatever. And that's what got his attention and he came to the church. Thus, God brought to pass the dream that he gave my wife. Now, oh, it ain't over yet. So all this has happened. And you may say, well, what's this got to do with the little girl, your mother? Oh, I'm getting there. And then about 2005, I have a dream one night. And in this dream, my mother's laying in a bed. And I walk up to the bed and I say, come on, Mom, it's time to go. And I grab her hand. And she says, I can't. I said, what do you mean? Come on. And I grabbed her hand again. I said, come. And she says, I can't get up from this one. And she grabbed a certain particular area of her body. And, and, and I remember it. And she says, I'm not going to get up from this. And I laid hands on her hand where her hand was laid. And I rebuked the devil. And I prayed in that dream. And I woke up tears in my eyes and I woke up Melissa and I said I think God has warned me about something with my mother then shortly after that we're talking a couple months later I had a dream that I was at her, my mom's house I was sitting on the couch with her I had her by the hand and she rededicated her life back to the Lord and was filled with the Holy Ghost so when I had that dream, honey, I put that promise in my pocket. Because remember the prophet of God said, the Lord has heard your prayer. Even though it was five years afterwards. No, actually, yeah, it was five years from the day that the, the man of God spoke that. Five years later, I had the dream, right, of her being given her heart to the Lord. But I had that dream that, have you ever had a dream or something from the Lord and you really didn't want to talk about it? But you knew it was a warning? Come on, this is helping somebody. So I had that. And then I'm at work and I get the phone call. Your mother has collapsed. We've got her in the ambulance. She's bleeding. And to make a long story short, she was bleeding from the area exactly where I saw in the dream. And I knew as soon as they told me that, the fear of God, I, I don't, just fear hit me and I knew exactly. I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what God showed me. So to make a long story short, she was diagnosed with stage 4 vulvar cancer. And um, so I, here I am praying, pleading, interceding. God, do, you know, the devil is, is attacking me the whole time. She's going to die and just like your, just like Jack, who's my stepfather, just like his last wife died of cancer, she's going to die too. And I said, I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just fine and rebuking. So she, as time goes on, she's getting worse and worse and worse. Now, she's to the point where they're giving her, they're saying, look, she, you know, unless it's a miracle of God, she's, she's going to go. So here we are, three days, the last three days of her life, I'm feeding her ice on a spoon. Watch it. Though the outward man was... Oh, oh, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. Wait, wait a minute. So, here... So I go back. She's in the hospital. My stepdad's in the hospital. Nobody's at her house. I go back home to her, to her house. I'm pacing the floor. And I'm, I'm, I'm having a conversation with God. Crying out to God. Saying, God, I'm, I'm serious. God, you cannot let her die. Because if she dies, then... Jack will harden his heart and there's no way I'll ever reach him because he's already had one wife. And I mean, I cry out to God. And I said, God, and I'm asked, I said, God, you've got to speak to me. You've got to do something. What is it going to take? What is, and I remember, and I heard the Lord. And I didn't hear an audible voice, but in here in my heart, the Lord spoke to me. He said, you, do you remember the dream that I showed you of her in the bed? I said, yes, Lord. He said, I showed you how the enemy... He says, I was going to he said, I showed you how the, the enemy was going to attack her body. And he says, I permit, because listen, anything that happens to you, God permits it. 
right, ready, right? Because Satan does not have power over your life. Come on, somebody. I can go to the book of Job and show you that. So God permitted it. And the Lord was speaking to me. He, I allowed this to happen. And he says, to bring about my glory. Now, I didn't understand what that meant yet. So I fell on my knees and cried to God because I knew right then that she was going to go to be with the Lord. But I was mad, Pastor. I was mad because I knew at the same time my stepdad, there's a chance that he's going to completely go and every little seed I've been sowing in him is going to be gone. Right? But come on. Look at somebody say, but God's bigger than the devil and any plan that he has. So here I go. And... um so I, here I am, and she, they're giving her three days, whatnot, so on and so forth. And again, I told you. So we're at her house. She, they let her come back home. They said, well, you know, we'll let her go back home before they put her in hospice. And they let, they let her come home for a little while. And there I am one day. I come over there with my Bible, and I begin to share with her the story about the woman with the issue of blood and how God can heal and I looked at her and I said, Mom, I said, God can heal you today and you can live another 20 years, but what profit is it if you live another 20 years and die and still go to hell? I said, God is more concerned about your eternal life than He is your healing. So this began to penetrate her and tears began to flow down and she grabbed my hand and she says, I want to ask Jesus to come back in my life again. And she said, I know I've fallen away. She said, but I want Him back. And she said, and I'm telling you, I didn't have to lead her. Come on, you really get serious with God. You don't need somebody to walk you by the hand. And she, she, shut every, she shut my aunt off. She shut me off. And she was having a conversation with God. And she asked Jesus to come back in her heart. And I'm telling you, brother, she got filled with the Spirit of God right there. And my dream was fulfilled. And here she was. Though the outer man was perishing, the inner man was being renewed day by day. And she got a phone call from some of her closest friends and said, Mary, I'm sorry to hear the news. And I'm so sorry to hear. And listen, I was right there. I, I was right beside my mom. And my mom on, the, on that phone said, listen, don't cry for me. I'm not scared. I got Jesus. And I ain't got nothing to worry about. And I, brother, listen. I, when she said that, I knew she got the real thing right there. I knew that, come on, there ain't nothing the devil's going to throw because it was over right there. So I had joy unspeakable and full of glory. There was part of me that was very sad that I was going to lose her on this earth and I was going to miss her, but it, it didn't matter as long because I knew, come on, David said when he lost his son, from the adulterous affair with Bathsheba, he says, I can't go, or he says, I can't bring him to me, but where he is, I can go be with him. So they bring her into hospice, and there she is, laying there, and she's not responsive, but the doctors say the last thing that goes out is their hearing. So I knew, so I go up to her, and we're all there except for one sister from New York. And I go up to her, and she's holding on. And I walk up to her and I get in her ear and I says, I just want you to let you know. She said, if, I said, if you're tired of fighting and you want to go be with your mother or you want to be, go with you with your mom and you want to go be with Jesus, I said, I release you. I said, don't worry about me. I'm going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. And she held on all the way to my aunt, her last sister got there. And when my last sister got there, she walked in the room, said her goodbyes, and she gave up the ghost. Now, Okay, it doesn't end there. I here I am, and of course, you know, was I heartbroken? Absolutely. I mean, that was a hard blow for me. I missed her. But then, I, here's my stepdad, who's just heart sick and broken. But he was beginning to face his own mortality. He was very bitter, yes, and he was he was mad at God. And um, so I'm still working on him. And I'm praying. I said, Jack, I just want you to know I'm praying. Yeah, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And still praying, praying. I said, I'm not going to give up on you. Come on, somebody. And uh, so then I'm going through my mom's stuff because we went through her stuff, uh, you know, after she passed and this. And we were, you know how that, that procedure goes. And that's when I found the box of letters. And that's how I knew that my mom was going to commit suicide. And I was reading the letters between her and 
and her sister and found out that when she found out she was born or that she was uh, pregnant with me is when she turned her whole life around. Are y'all seeing this big picture? The plan of God unfolding? So here I am as time progressed. I, I began to prepare myself because I knew, I felt it in my spirit that my stepdad wasn't going to be here any, any much longer. I said, God, you've got to give me an opportunity. You've got to give me an opportunity. Don't let him die before he gives his heart to the Lord. So, again, I get the phone call. We've rushed him to the hospital. We don't know what's going on. It doesn't look good. Now, you've got to understand, his all, he, he has five sons, and four out of the five are atheists. They don't serve God. But I thought all five of them were. Watch this. So I get to the hospital, or four, I'm sorry, four sons, and three out of the four. So we get to the hospital, and I'm praying, and I'm on my way. I'm on my way to the hospital. Um, and I say, God, you got to give me an opportunity. So I get up there, and, um, and it's just like the, the door shut. I didn't get an opportunity to get in there. I went home frustrated. And I was rebuking the devil. I said, devil, you will not have him in Jesus' name. Come on, we got to get militant for, people, for souls. And then the second day I tried, it didn't happen. But on the third day, come on somebody, on the third day, I was on my way. And I'm telling you, that third day, everything that could happen, happened. I almost, come on, somebody almost, I almost got in a wreck. Someone was yelling at me in the parking lot, was, was basically threatening me over nothing. And I mean, everything go wrong. And I was like, what is going on? So I knew something was big was getting ready to happen. So I get to the hospital. And I get in there. And they're like, you know, he's stabilized. And they're going to move him out of hospice, but he, they're saying he could go for weeks. But he's stabilized, everything's all right. And if you want to go in there, just talk to him, whatever. And uh, they said, um, so remember, I had been praying. And they said, um, and, but I knew, I said, God, and I prayed, I said, God, you've got to give me a, a time to get in there by himself. Because if any of his bro uh, sons are in there, they're not going to let me talk about God. So they said, so. Uh, one of his sons come out and they said, um, you can go in there because Greg's in there. I'm like, okay. So I go in there and there's Greg. Here's my stepdad. He's on the. Re he's not responsive. I mean, that's how bad it is. He's getting ready to go. You know, they don't know. They said he's just not responsive, but he's he's just, you know, he's, he's just existing. You know, but he's not being able to communicate. Now remember, the last thing goes out you're hearing, right? So we're in there and I'm talking to Greg and we get to talking and somehow the door opened for me to talk about the Lord. And I start sharing my testimony about how I gave my heart to the Lord. And I remember, I keep in mind, his other three brothers, you even talk about God, brother, they're going to shut you down. Get this. The one brother that just so happened to be in the room that day used to be a Sunday school teacher. In fact, he's come to my church. He's come to this church. Y'all have met him. His name's Greg. And his wife, y'all remember that? He came one service. He came one time to visit. And we started talking for like 15 minutes about the Lord. And Greg looked at me and he smiled. And he says, I know you want some time with Jack by yourself. He says, so I'm going to step out and you can have your time. And I knew, brother, that was it. So I got up there. He went out of the room. And I put my hand on, his sh on, on Jack's shoulder. Now keep in mind, he was stabilized for hours, a day, actually a couple days, like stabilized. And they said he can go weeks. Put him in hospice, whatever, and, just, and let him comfortable. So I get up there, and you can see, you know, the vital signs, heart monitor. So I start speaking in his ear, and I said, I, I begin to, I, I showed them, I told him again, I said, I love you. you I, this is Ricky, you know who this is. I love you. I said, I've never stopped. I've never given up on you. I never stopped praying. I said, but you know that Mary is in heaven with Jesus, in the presence of Jesus right now. And I said, you can be with her. I said, don't. I said, I don't care what the devil's told you that he can't forgive you. And I, listen, I'm not. He's not even responsive, right? But he can hear me. And I said, if you, in your heart, come on, God's bigger than that. In your heart, if you will ask Jesus to forgive you. And come into your heart. He will save you right now. And your suffering will be over. And you can go on and be with Jesus and Mary. My mom. Be with them in heaven. 
No more pain, no more sorrow. And I saw his vitals begin to change. Like, you know, going up a little bit. So I prayed, and I had the peace of God come over me. Now, what's it, you want to hear something interesting? It, this day, it was July 17th, 2011. My mom died on August 17th, 2005. Now, I may not do nothing to you, but that was a sign to me. Three days and almost exactly, uh, uh, what is it, six years to the, to the day of one month? And I'm like, oh, something's heavy. So I had the peace of God come on me. I walk out. Five minutes go by, and the nurse comes out. You've got to get in here. He's, he's going right now, going right now. And my, I heard them say, wait a minute. You said he was stable, stabilized, and nothing wrong. What is going on? I knew it was going on, Roger. He gave his heart to the Lord and he was ready to go with Jesus. Oh, how do you know that, brother? Listen, I know that I know that I know. Because you wasn't in the room, I was. And God confirmed it. Watch this. So they're all rushing in there. I rush in there. We're in there. His four brothers, three are atheists. One is not, has a soft heart. Oh, and I guess it was just a coincidence that the one who has a soft heart was the one that was in the room that allowed me to have the opportunity to come in there and talk to him. Mm -mm. God set it up. So I go in there, and they bring in the priest. Y'all know what I'm talking about, the chaplain or whatever. He comes in there to say the rites. One of the brothers looked at the priest and says, Get out. We don't believe in God. We don't need God. And he don't want God. And we don't want you in here. I was standing there, and I sat back in the corner, Roger, and I laughed and says, Yeah, you stupid devil. You thought you were going to do it, but you're too late. Because God already got to him. So I just watched him and his everything just started going. And I had the peace of God. I said, I was thinking, Mom, he's getting ready to come home. So we're sitting in the room and I'm watching this happen. And I'm thinking, how good is God? So what am I talking about tonight? For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of good to give you a future, to give you a hope and an expected end. I don't believe it's the will of God for us just to be going to piddling around on earth and not have a purpose. Every single person, every person under the sound of my voice, there's a plan of God for you. I don't care if you're listening to this by internet and you were raised in, in the house of God or you were raised in a family serving God, you're backslid. I don't care what you're doing or what condition you're in. Your sin does not intimidate God. And the only reason why you're alive and listening to me is God has people that are still praying for you. They haven't given up on you. They haven't left you. They haven't deserted you. And tonight is your night. Won't y'all stand tonight? Hallelujah to you, God. Thank you, Lord. Come on, I really believe this, this message was for somebody. Maybe you're here tonight and you've got family members. Come on, they're prodigals. They've been raised in the house of God, but they've went back to Egypt. They went back to the house of Pharaoh. They went back to the, to the, to the ways of the world. But honey, you can pray and miserable every single day of their life until they submit back to God. Maybe you're listening to this and you've never given your heart to Jesus. You think you're here by accident. You think you're here by evolution. Fully on that. If you, if you listen to everything I just said, this message, and you say it's a coincidence, then pray that it's absolutely you. Pray for them right now.
right where you're at. Want you to be out. I know we don't have room up here to do an altar call, but you can get right where you're at. Make an altar. Begin to cry. Listen. On my face before God and cried until I couldn't cry anymore. When was the last time we did that for people? God, give us a burden for the lost. God, I refuse to be comfortable while people go to hell right in front of me. We sit in our cushion pews by our family and our friends and our loved ones and our co workers are dying and going to hell. Shame on us. Only you, to God. God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I stand. I stand in agreement with every person under the sound of my voice. I pray in that lost son. I pray in that lost daughter. I pray in that husband. I pray in that wife. I pray in that uncle, that aunt, that grandpa, that grandmother, that co-worker. Come on, somebody. I pray in Jesus' name. intimidated Herod and he set out to try to kill Jesus but he could not prevail because when God says it ain't over it ain't over you're gonna be worth it you're gonna be worth it the devil's trying to kill some of you with sickness with disease with car accidents with work accidents with overdoses whatever it may be but no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. You're gonna be worth it. You're gonna be worth it all. I believe this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And ye shall be saved. You and your whole household. Gonna be worth it all. You think God wants us to lose one loved one? No, God spoke to Abraham and says, if you can find ten righteous in an entire city, I'll spare it. The book of Jasher says that God, the book of Jewish history, God, when, when, I'm sorry, when Noah was building the ark, he warned the people for a hundred years that a flood was coming. And once the door was shut, and the rain began to fall and the fountains of the deep burst open. 700,000 people screamed and came bursting out of nowhere and, and slamming at, the, at the, the door of the ark, screaming, let us in. But I believe, Pastor, I believe that God was weeping. 
I don't think God has joy. Some people think that God has joy in punishing people and destroying the wicked. I don't think he does. I think God set up in heaven and he wept and he cried over the thousands and thousands of people that perished because they hardened their hearts and shook their fist at God. Because my Bible says in 2 Peter 3.9 that God is not slack concerning His promises as many past slackness, but is long-suffering and wills that none perish and all come to the difference. If you're listening to this by any way, you've never given your heart to Jesus. What are you waiting for? Listen, I'm not going to ask you to repeat anything after me. I'm going to ask you to be wherever you I don't care if you're, in your, if you're in your car, you need to pull over and start crying out to God. If you're in your living room, if you're in your bathroom, if you're in your house, if you're in your garage, I don't care where you're at, God's not intimidated by location. You make an altar to God, you begin to cry out to God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13, that if you'll call upon me with all your heart and seek me with all your heart, I shall be 